so hello and welcome to everyone. Um, this is a sort of third installment of the series that we have been doing, so we thought that maybe it might be a good idea to introduce ourselves to the hosts. So um, just on sort of behalf of myself and Thomas Williams, we are grad students at UC Irvine. Um, Tom is fifth year in English, I am third year in visual studies. Um, and also another sort of important statistic for us is that we are each rent burdened around 75%. So before we turn things over to our speaker today, I just want to talk a little bit about sort of why we are here. Um, this series is very much a response to a negotiation of both the COLA movement at University of California and the current COVID pandemic um, in coordination with sort of an ongoing schedule of events hosted by Strike U. Um, we hope that this space and the conversations generated here with our lovely speakers will sort of not only help to grow our movement, but further really kind of answer or address this question of what it means to hold a digital picket. To, to do this virtually, and perhaps this might be something that our speaker will talk about later. Um, to that end, we've also decided um, that we should come up with a title for what we're doing. Um, so the one that we have brainstormed is, fuck you, pay us. We feel like that sort of gets to the heart of the matter of what we're doing here. So uh, let us know what you think, but that is sort of where we're at with our series. So what is COLA? I'm just gonna quickly kind of go over this, although I'd like to assume that most people here are already have some level of familiarity and awareness of COLA. So just a brief history of the COLA movement here at the UC. Um, COLA stands for cost of living adjustment. Um, in a sense, that means COLA is not so much a movement, but it is an essential demand. Um, the majority of ASE's academic student employees across the University of California are rent burdened um, because living costs have massively overtaken any rise in wages. At UCI, UC Irvine in particular, the majority of graduate students cite their financial situation as a major source of stress for them. Over the past six years, housing costs for UCI grads have exceeded the federal um, standards for burden. The average UCI grad spends about 43% of their income on housing. That's the average with some students reporting spending as much as 80%. Um, if we jump to sort of think about faculty and instructor pay compared with say like the salaries of the athletic department. You know, this is really a picture of a university culture that prioritizes cost savings and generating income versus quality of education and the proper compensation for its instructors. So that's sort of the general orientation about COLA now for some recent strike history. Um, graduate students at UC Santa Cruz um, began organizing for a COLA in September of 2019. Um, after sort of exhausting any channels of communication and negotiating with the administration, they began a wildcat strike in December of 2019. The basis of the wildcat strike was a withholding of grades. On February 10th of this year, um, something that seems both very recent and very much in the distant past at this point, um, they escalated to a full strike. The university's response to this was basically to institute massive police presence at UC Santa Cruz. It's estimated that this costs around $300,000 per day. Um, on February 20th, at a rally at UC Irvine, police arrested a black alum unaffiliated with the rally who was merely trying to get a copy of her transcript, and they arrested her with excessive force. Um, so we kind of jump back to February. Over the sort of those weeks, um, other campuses also joined the strike. Um, February 28th, 80 plus TAs were fired from UC Santa Cruz. 20% of those TAs were either international or DACA. So effectively, this meant that they were at risk of deportation. Um, but it's also important to note that their health insurance was revoked and was not reinstated until March 16th. So if we start to think about sort of pandemic timelines, um, that is quite a significant thing. Um, I also want to point out that on March 1st, UCI, I went back on my email for this, sent out its first mass communication about COVID. Um, this message, and we kind of know like administrators of different campuses had sent sort of different versions of this message, did not contain any public health information or strategies for maintaining the health and well-being of the students and staff, but rather outlined some rather forceful guidelines for maintaining grade books online and preventing further grade strikes. Um, by March 5th, we held a UC-wide blackout. This was our final rally in person. By March 8th, the campus was closed for finals week and the transition to online classes was announced for spring quarter. Um, so in this sort of brief history, we're now more or less up to our current moment. And this is where kind of COLA and COVID sort of intertwine. Um, the UC has transitioned everyone to online instruction with no training, no compensation for this transition, scant support, resources to create adequate working environments in our already unstable housing situations. We have effectively raced into an uncertain pedagogic future. We are compromising the quality of education for our students. 
any refund or so request to refund tuition or campus fees. These fees are now entirely moot when no one's on campus. Um, these have been thoroughly rebuffed by the university. Um, students and staff have been exposed to hateful and violent Zoom bombings um, as a result of unilaterally pushing us all onto our current platform, Zoom. Um, is an untested platform that had immense security concerns as we sort of pushed online. Tom and I have personally witnessed these um, and extremely terrifying targeting our sort of colleagues of color. Um, there are similar concerns with intellectual property in Canvas. We can talk about course materials, publications, syllabi, recorded lectures, everything that is now being hosted on this platform. At every turn, it really seems that the university has made decisions that continue to exploit our labor and jeopardize our health. Our students and their families are facing skyrocketing on and under employment. Um, and, you know, this is sort of in addition to the situation we are already in of trying to sort of survive on our sort of meager grad student stipend. Students are food insecure, they've been forced off campus, and yet, again, we are plunging straight ahead into our spring quarter on schedule, and we're now at the halfway point. So UCI for COLA, and again, we have this orientation because Tom and I are from UC Irvine, so we're speaking to some of the specific um, actions on our campus, has responded to these needs and so the lack of adequate university response through a social welfare strike, which took place the first week of the quarter, and the formation of mutual aid network to care for our community where care is utterly lacking. Um, so that was sort of a quick jump through sort of what has been going on. Um, I don't know if Tom, you have anything else to add, but maybe I might pass it to you perhaps to introduce our speaker and then we'll go from there. And you're muted, Tom. Okay, um, I mean, I don't I don't really have anything else to add. I think you've kind of covered everything kind of wonderfully, Molly. Um, and I don't think I have to kind of do much of an introduction to for the people that who are who are here. I, I'm sure you know what you're what you're in for. Um, so, without much further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Joshua Clover, who will be speaking on general on the general strike theory and practice. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for setting this up. Before I start, I want to give a bunch of shout outs to various people. Uh, and shout out first to Annie McClanahan, uh, since this is coming out of Irvine and all the other comrades from 2009. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my old friend Amanda Hickok, who's here. Um, special shout out to my friend Sarah, who spoke last week in the series to get started, and Troy, who spoke this week. Uh, I also want to thank Thomas and Molly and give a shout out to UCI for COLA and in fact, all the COLAs, um, especially, not to, be, not to be patriotic, but especially UCD COLA for all. Uh, and this talk is really for them. Uh, and also I wanna give a shout out to rent strikers across the world, uh, especially at UCLA and all the way east in New York. We see you launching the Columbia Rent Strike Work Strike. Uh, and lastly for today, a shout out to everybody who's working at and with strikers at Amazon and Whole Foods and Instacart tomorrow, and all the students who are starting to think that as the university organizes the latest austerity regime around the idea of charging prestige prices for the online traffic school version of higher education, maybe everyone should just not pay. With that, I'm gonna move on to my topic. There's this joke that Marxists have predicted 10 of the last three crises of capitalism. And there's this bookend joke that goes with it that anarchists have called for 150 of the last two general strikes. And these jokes are funny because they're true. Uh, but there's also something funny about the association of specific tactics uh, with particular political persuasions. Rosa Luxemburg wrote this great essay that demonstrated pretty persuasively that a given, given tactic could change its social force and its significance over time that tactics are not static, and that a given tactic could go from being common or proper to one political tendency or movement to that of another. This is a sort of obvious point, but the inability to understand it often leads to confusion. The specific tactic she was writing about was what she called the mass strike. And 114 years later, here we are. By the way, the hosts are dropping in links in the chat. I'm going to be mentioning a few texts as I go uh, so that I can appear for a brief moment like a scholar before I move into the whole uh, burning stuff phase. Uh, so you can, you can see links down there if you're interested in, in sort of following up these texts. So 
Despite the title of this talk, which promises two parts, theory and practice, in honesty, there's probably three. So I want to first mention, before I get to theory and practice, some of the reasons that there's often some confusion around what a general strike is. Then I'm going to try and situate the general strike within the basic framework I've been using to theorize the political economy of social movements. And then I want to enter into the speculative phase at the end, which is paradoxically the practical part where we discuss what a general strike might actually involve as a set of practices. For the latter two parts, it's going to be all slideshow, which I'll do via screen sharing, a TED talk, but make it communist. But for the moment, I'll just sort of talk straight ahead about the category of, uh, or the question of confusions around the general strike. In some sense, this deserves its own talk, and I'll only mention a couple, three, four confusions before moving on. Uh, four, if you count the one already mentioned, which is the ahistorical fixed association of given tactics with given political formation. So the idea that general strikes are somehow anarchist uh, or that um, uh, you know, labor strikes are automatically communist or, or whatever. Um, and that creates its own confusion. Another confusion concerns the fact that the terms mass strike and general strike are sometimes used to mark out a difference and sometimes used interchangeably. I take this to be a semantic problem. And since we are interested today in the actual content of a general strike, I don't think we need to linger on that confusion. The remaining two confusions are both more serious and are profoundly entangled with each other. The third confusion is the broad use of the term strike for all kinds of actions that do not seem to fit the category of withdrawing labor to interfere with the firm's functions and profits. Some examples of this are strike debt uh, and the rent strike, both of which are fine things, desirable things, but the way they interfere with some firm's functions and profits is by refusing to pay for shit. And I guess you can always make the argument that that's somehow a strike because of capital's infinite interconnectedness. But if these are strikes, then a boycott is also a strike. Looting is a strike, everything's a strike. But then everything is also a riot. So it's not sure that's a clarifying approach. Um, I should be clear that I'm not trying to shame anyone for like appropriating strike culture. If anyone has the commitment and capacity and courage to undertake such an action, they really get to call it whatever the fuck they want. Um, and I also want to be mindful of the desire described by Veronica Gago. Uh, she's one of the organizers of the International Women's Strike in Argentina. The desire to, in her words, overflow the strike, which perhaps means to expand its historical boundaries, or perhaps means to start from the standpoint of the strike precisely so as to see uh, what its limits are and escape them. Anyway, all of this, along with the legitimate historical charisma of the strike that was purchased with the blood of workers, means the term gets broadly applied and sometimes perplexingly. The last confusion concerns the subject of the general strike. Uh, the persistent historical association of strikes is the working class in a way that implicitly but clearly designates the waged worker. And from this standpoint, a general strike often ends up designating a traditional labor strike organized through fairly traditional channels, often unions, but you know, across shops or across sectors or across the entire economy. Certainly this meaning closely attends the general strike history in the United States from the late 19th through the mid 20th century but it starts to come under pressure fairly early on. One of the great moments in thinking the general strike along with Luxembourg is the chapter from W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction called General Strike, published the year after the great U.S. strike wave of 1934. Du Bois identifies the actions of enslaved people in the South during the Civil War, actions which form an ensemble including working poorly, refusing to work entirely, fleeing to the North, joining the Union Army, escaping into marinage. He describes this ensemble as the Black General Strike, through which, in his famous verdict, 
the slaves freed themselves. Importantly, Cedric Robinson, in an essay about this, draws forth Du Bois's sense that the black general strike arose, quote, as a consequence of contradictions within Southern society, rather than a revolutionary vanguard that knit these phenomena into a historical force. So one of the things we see in this early insistence on broadening the subject of the general strike, uh, uh, sorry, this early insistence on broadening the subject of the general strike beyond wage workers. Du Bois pointedly refers to the black proletariat. And this distinction between working class and proletariat is the difference that makes a difference. As the latter, simply meaning those without reserves, more clearly includes not just the traditional working class, but also the unemployed, those who work beyond and before the wage, such as the enslaved, but also say those who do unwaged reproductive labor in the domestic sphere. So this insistence on the proletariat rather than the working class as the subject of the general strike is a kind of demand to register the presence and lives and political desires of those who are likely, more likely to be racialized as non-white, those who are more likely to be gendered as non-male. This helps form the basis for Elise Weinbaum's engagement with Du Bois, which is called gendering the general strike. And by the latter part of the 20th century, aside from those still welded to the so-called labor metaphysic, it was broadly understood that the general strike is general because it generalizes across all sectors of the proletariat, so that by the time we arrive, say, in France in 1968, we have a general strike that includes organized labor, but also students, the unemployed, and so on, all engaging in actions which overflow the withdrawal of labor. The more general it becomes, the less strike, though the name survives. So having noted these potential confusions, which often turn on what a general strike isn't, I want to turn to the theoretical question of what a general strike is. And to do that, I'm going to have to uh, go through a sort of display, a schema of capital uh, via slideshow that for some of you will be all too familiar, but I hope it will pr prove useful for some of us. And here's where I make the move to screen share, which as I'm sure many of you are aware, sometimes works, sometimes eh, we'll find out. Yeah, I'm getting more of that. Eh, ah, keynote general strike three. Let's try that. Okay, so Molly, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing the screen share? Thank you. Okay, so for those of you who are working with a single, possibly small screen, you'll notice that the little box of uh, images that you have of, of, of uh, people who are here with us is obscuring part of the screen. You have various choices here. You can make all the pictures of people go away, uh, but you can also reduce the size of the, of the keynote demonstration, the slideshow by 50%. There's a, a, a menu clicker, and I believe the, the upper center of your screen, which allows you to reduce it to 50%, and thus you'll see the entire slideshow, and you can also still see a box of people, uh, and uh, so you can sort of do it either way. So this is the, the general strike theory and practice uh, phase. And as I said, I'm just gonna sort of start by schematizing the structure of capital itself in a, in a particular way. So uh, capital begins, the, the capitalist begins with uh, the, the formula MCM. They, they start with money and they produce commodities by purchasing, as we know, labor power means of production. They put them together, they end up with a commodity. Um, and then they sell that commodity for money, except of course, it's very important that it has to be more money. So that's the great formula, MCM prime. And as noted, that has two moments in it, right? The moment of, uh, in, in which the capitalist turns money into commodities, and then the moment when those commodities go out into the marketplace, seeking a buyer uh, and are eventually sold for money. So those are the two moments 
of the, the formula for capital. And they're the two spheres of capital, right? The sphere of production and the sphere of circulation derived from those two moments of the transaction. The term spheres is Marx's own term, actually. Uh, he, uses it, he uses it repeatedly. I'm sure many of you who've read Capital will recall the moment where he says, let us now take leave of the noisy sphere of production, uh, sorry, the noisy sphere of circulation, by which he means the marketplace, the shouting, the bargaining, all that stuff, uh, and go now into the sphere of production. Uh, so there's two spheres, they're interlinked, they, they're not just activities, uh, you know, because production is where you make shit, circulation is where you know, com commodities uh, move around, change places, are sold, are consumed, and so on. Uh, but these are also sort of spheres of social existence, right? Where if you're a wage worker, your life is oriented by the production process. Uh, if you're not a wage worker, but are still market dependent, where you work in the sphere of circulation, you know, maybe you do work at, uh, as, a, as a bookkeeper, a classic circulation activity, or a, or a cashier, uh, so if you work in that sphere, or if you're unemployed but still market dependent, your life is in circulation. Uh, and they have their own logics, right? valorization and realization, and surplus value and pro profit. Essentially, the, the sphere is regulated by value and price. Each comes with its own measure. Value is measured in socially necessary labor time. Price is me measured in money. Nah, this is all just standard backstory. We don't really need this, but I just thought I would uh, include it. Mostly what matters is that there's the sphere of production and the sphere of circulation, um, and they have their own forms of struggle that go with them, right? Which we can give very simple names, production struggles and circulation struggles. Um, and and uh, so if your life is oriented by production, you're likely to engage in production struggles. If your life is oriented by circulation, your life is likely, to, and you wanna struggle, it's likely to involve circulation struggles. So this is actually the entirety of the, of the logic and the, the format that I used for my last book, um, but it's not a complete picture of capitalist society. It's just how society looks from the perspective purely of, of capital. Uh, and one thing to remember is that although we've divided into these two spheres, they do form a single unit, right? A single loop which uh, joins them together and which uh, gets referred to as the, the reproduction of capital. So MCM, uh, the, the, well, the, the connection and interlinking of production and circulation, the full motion of a commodity through that, that reproduces capital, but it can't work entirely by itself. As soon as we put that up there, we realize there's this whole other sphere also interlinked with it. Now my chart's getting slightly complicated, but I think, I think we can handle it. And this sphere is the reproduction of the, of the proletariat we follow the logic of CMC, the, the poor proletarian starts with C, that's their own labor power as a commodity. They sell it for money. They take that money and they buy food and shelter um, and whatever else they need to survive and uh, reproduce themselves. Now, the canny uh, 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 Marx nerd will notice that I simply reproduced this famous diagram uh, which among other things, this great diagram is one of the best named diagrams in the world. It actually is rarely called by a name in English. It's usually called by either its French or its German name. Its French name is the Double Moulinet, which means the double millstone. You can see it's, it's a lovely name, right? Because the mill is sort of there at the origins of, of capitalism. Uh, the, and the two millstones that grind away producing flour, let's say, but here, the two millstones and the reproduction of capital, the reproduction of labor power, grinding against each other, but producing capital, uh, producing surplus value by grinding against each other with their opposing interests. Uh, so that's sort of a lovely name for it. The Germans, however, call it the Zwickmühle. My German is even worse than my French. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the Zwickmühle means dilemma, which is another great name for it, right? Because this situation is a dilemma if you're a proletarian how do you reproduce yourself and stay alive with that reference to capital, which allows you to reproduce yourself because it pays you a wage so that it can reproduce itself. Uh, you have to sell yourself right in the, in, in the sequence. So we have this schema and the thing that's missing, I think obviously enough, is the remaining category of struggle, which we would obviously call reproduction struggles that go down there. 
So those are the three categories of struggle, basically, within the, 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 the whole of, of capital. And I want to sort of go over them uh, uh, briefly, right? Each, each one, each genre of struggle contains various kinds of tactics and activities. So circulation struggles include, you know, barricades and blockades and occupations. Uh, but most famously, the riot is the form of circulation struggle that is a demand over prices in the sphere of the market that often exceeds the mere demand for you know, lower bread prices into things like looting and, prop and, and, and what gets called property damage and, uh, and, and fighting with cops and various other kinds of things. And that's sort of the signature circulation struggle. For production struggles, same thing. There's several kinds um, that involve interfering with production, work to measure, work to rule, uh, uh, slowdowns, actual sabotage. But the exemplary form is the strike, of course, is the dominant form of production struggle. Reproduction struggles, it's a little bit more challenging to narrate since they're not so clearly located within the logic of capital. Like they're not so clearly, uh, they don't so, so clearly require a, a conflict with the market or a conflict with the, the boss. Uh, um, but they do require endless struggle. In the simplest sense, reproductive struggles, I would say struggles for a, 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 a community, a collective, an individual, a family, a social whole to reproduce itself involves, you know, care work, growing food. We could think of all of these as reproductive struggles, but a full-on reproduction struggle that involves a collective reproduction without reference to capital would be, of course, the commune, uh, would be the exemplary form of the reproduction struggle or the end game of a reproduction struggle. So those are my three genres of struggle each with several things within it. Those are my exemplary forms. And I want to take those and make everything look like a cartoon. OK, so, so there's your, our riot, strike, and commune as our three uh, um, sort of, you know, technically, they're synecdoche, right? They stand for a larger category. They're the part that stands for the whole. Riot stands for circulation struggles. Strike stands for production struggles, and so on. And I have them separated here, but you all saw the Venn diagram coming. We can think of them as overlapping, uh, as interacting with each other, which of course they do. And we'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. And where they all overlap, I'm gonna say, and this is essentially my claim for tonight's talk, we could walk out of here as soon as I say this, that where these all overlap is a general strike. A general strike is when all of these activities are set in motion uh, by various people, maybe acting collectively, maybe not acting collectively. Um, and so with that, I want to move to the category of practice and talk about that for a few minutes. And then we can have some questions. And I don't promise answers, but we can certainly have questions. So what I want to talk about in the practical period is the Oakland general strike of 2021. Now, I choose 2021 for the simple reason that I'm not really convinced there's going to be a general strike tomorrow. Um, I hope so. Uh, um, I don't know if there's going to be a general strike in 2021. I also hope so. But I choose 20, 2021 for a reason, just as I choose Oakland for a reason. In part, I'm from Oakland. So uh, um, I, I know it fairly well, and I'm able to have somewhat coherent thoughts about it and its history. But also, the last general strike in the United States was also in Oakland in 1946. Uh, so that seems like a, a nice lineage. And as a nice form of symmetry, the amount of time between the general strike of 2021 and the general strike of 1946 is exactly the same as the amount of time between the open general strike of, 18, of 1946 and the Paris Commune of 1871. Nice 75-year chunks, works out very smoothly. I love symmetry, moving on. So let's talk about the open general strike of 2021 and what it might look like. So we know we're going to have to bring in all three of the activities. So let's start with a nice circulation struggle. Let's have some blockades. Let's blockade the ports. It's pretty easy. There's a three access roads there. Um, now we've got them blockaded. Let's blockade the big freeways in a couple of places. It'll give our friends up in Berkeley something to do to keep them busy. Uh, and then there's another blockade there. Those are two classic places to blockade those freeways. 
So now we have some nice blockades. There's a version of our circulation struggle. And of course, we have the classic labor strike. We have people walking off work and refusing to work. Let's assume that it mostly happens in this area. This is sort of the business area of Oakland. Oakland's quite large, if you don't know. Uh, covers a lot of ground geographically. So this doesn't even quite include all of Oakland, but almost all of it. Uh, but that's the, the increasingly growing uh, commercial area downtown and beyond. Uh, and let's assume that's where people walk off work. That's certainly what happened in 1946. It started with 400. Uh, there was a mass general strike, but mostly it's businesses in that area. And now I want to make a move, which is to talk about uh, camp encampments of the unhoused in Oakland. There's many, many different encampments of the unhoused in Oakland. Uh, I'm just going to point out three of them. So they're going to be these, these green arrows. The, the one in the lower right is the High Street encampment. It's near the parking lot of a Home Depot. The uppermost one is called 37 MLK, which is at 37 Street of Martin Luther King, as you could guess, uh, in an empty lot that was uh, became a homeless encampment several years ago and is still ongoing. It was founded entirely by women of color. Um, it still is uh, officially a women's encampment, although they've decided to allow uh, uh, partners uh, to, be, to be part of the encampment, and that's still ongoing. And then the one furthest to the west is the house that was uh, occupied by Moms for Housing, a recent movement which decided to help uh, uh, with a bunch of uh, mothers who were unhoused moving into vacant homes. And, and defending some homes against eviction. So those are just three current encampments uh, or recent encampments of unhoused people. So now I'm going to pull up uh, a map of evictions in the Bay Area in 2016, which is the most recent uh, complete map that I have. So it's a little hard to see the screen, I know, because of the colors. Here, let me make the three, those three encampments bounce a little bit. You can see, you can see them. And you can note those yellow dots are all evictions as in 2016. You can note that these encampments tend to spring up at the edges of high eviction areas. So people get evicted from these areas and pushed out a little bit and find open, find open parcels or open bits of land uh, in various places. Maybe it's a, 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 an unbuilt up uh, housing parcel. Maybe it's by, the, by, by a road, it's un, undeveloped. But that tends to be where these encampments develop by these roads. So what we want to imagine uh, for our general strike is an extension of the sort of the moms for housing move where you take vacant homes, which of course there's a, a large number famously, there's 3.8 times as many vacant, vacant uh, homes in Oakland as there are unhoused people. So there's enough room for everyone. So we can imagine in fact this moment where, we, where people start getting together, you know, I would assume led by some, someone like, some group like Moms for Housing and the groups around those, groups like this exist in many cities. And they start to move people into houses in given neighborhoods, that green neighborhood, which we'll go ahead and call that a commune, right? Some people already live there, that's West Oakland. Some people already live there, unhoused people have moved in there and that neighborhood starts to function uh, um, as a sort of autonomous neighborhood. Uh, they stop paying rent, obviously. Maybe many of them are already on rent strike. There's a bunch of unhoused people. They're not going to pay rent. And that's our May Day. Right? That's our general strike. We have all three features. We now have sort of an autonomous neighborhood where people can live um, that is going to have to be defended. So let's pull those blockades back a little bit to close off or block off the major areas to make it harder for police to get in and things like that. We have the area of the strike. Uh, and uh, so, and these places, of course, all um, have interrelations with each other. All, all these various genres of struggle overlap so that the strikes, right, sorry, the blockades, for example, protect the commune so that it can function. The commune allows people to not pay rent so they can afford to stay out of work um, because they don't need the money for rent. Uh, and the people who are on strike can thus leave not to go to work and command the blockades. We see all these various ways that these three moments or three modes or three genres of struggle interrelate with each other and indeed sort of uh, collapse together into a, a single action. So that's my story. What a general strike could look like.
right? And the kinds of activity that need feature. And ideally, right, the thing that has to happen next is San Francisco has to, be, has to have a general strike. We need a San Francisco commune. We need a Berkeley commune. We need a San Leandro commune. And those all successfully defend Oak, the Oakland commune because those are the ways you get to Oakland. And as it grows, each one is defending the others and you get a sort of increase in it. And hopefully it spreads uh, into something larger than a general strike. Uh, I'm gonna call it with that. I'm gonna thank you very much for your uh, attention. I'm gonna turn off screen sharing and come back and I'm gonna turn it over to our hosts to host the Q&A.